Harvesting Six Pack Hour. With your hosts, Joe Bob and AJ Apple. Welcome to the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. My name is Joe Bond, founder of Fantasy Six Pack What are you? What are you rushing me? I don't care. Oh my gosh! There we go. All right. Um, with me as usual, my co-host AJ Uppergarth and Dap Scott. What's going on, guys? Hello, hello. On, man? Happy uh, official first day of March Madness. I do not count Thursday, Thursday, Wednesday. Screw those games. Although UVA <laughs> got smoked and embarrassed, so. Yes, maybe awesome. maybe I do want to count that one. <laughs> they got smoked and uh, embarrassed. Meanwhile, the Hokies actually won against another Virginia school, Richmond, in the NIT. You know, the the not invited we, tournament. But we don't, we don't talk about that one. Yeah, that's okay. We just Jody did. was Jody was talking to me about. She was like she was like, oh wait, she saw him on TV. She's like, oh wait, did did it already start? This isn't the real thing, is it? Isn't this the uh, isn't this like the the other one? And I looked over at I'm like, just say it. You know, you want to say the loser's bracket. Thank you. Yes. Um, technically, it is because, yeah, they suck. Anyway. All right. Moving yes, on. Yes. Uh, so tonight, we've got a good show. We're going to be talking about some spring training performances, lineup trends, and uh, all that kind of good stuff. We've got a great guest lined up for you. Um, before we jump into that, though, just want to remind everybody to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave those comments. Uh, we appreciate it. And, uh, of course, jump over to FantasySixPack.net, become an all-access member. You're going to get access to our draft cheat sheet. I know some of you still have your drafts upcoming. You're going to get access to our award-winning rankings, our projections. Dap, your screen is, like, flickering. Like, oh, it, I don't sorry. know what is happening today. That. You are – this is all sorts of craziness with you today. Um, anyway, and then uh, – <laughs> Dap has gone missing into the abyss behind us. Um, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so, and then, of course, you're going to be able to uh, talk to all of us on our members only Discord channels where you get to ask your custom league questions and, you know, waiver advice, that kind of stuff, just for your specific leagues. Uh, it's pretty invaluable information over there that we can give you. Um, last thing, AJ and, and Dap, I'm sure you can. Uh, second this but i want to thank everybody who listens and watches this show uh we were in a baseball pods bracket challenge thing this year for i think at aj this is like fourth or fifth year in a row yeah, um i think so last like we usually get knocked out like the first couple of rounds it is what it is last year we got to the elite eight which seemed pretty crazy and then got absolute train wrecked by like rates and barrels or something it was like okay yeah it's it's over like once we hit the big the big boys like we out like it, it don't even matter um yeah. kind of expected so this year we actually went through a couple pretty big pods um and shockingly got to the final four and dude i i I know, I know we lost. Eventually, we lost to the Tool Shed. Um, mad, mad props to Eric Cross and Chris Clegg for that sh that show that they do. It is awesome. Yeah. Um, did not feel one bit sad to lose to lose <laughs> no. to them at all, man. Like you know, we were going to, and, and then you know this this round we would have gone up against Fantasy Baseball Today, which is like CBS, I believe, and like yeah, it's just you, we would get wrecked. So it's like I mean, like it's it was just an honor to be uh voted as far as we as, as we got so um thank you for everybody uh for for getting us there it was uh it was a fun ride <laughs> yeah it was very uh very fun and again i i echo the same sentiment as joe it's it just means a lot to us for for everybody to come out like to be able to listen to our show and and get our content out there and um it, you know i i'm I'm just along for the ride myself too. So I, I uh, stop. It's it's an honor for 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 me personally to to see us moving up the the ranks like that, and it does mean a lot. So we appreciate everybody that voted and uh, everybody that that signed up and and 
that's been watching our shows over the last you know week or so that this tournament's been going on and uh yeah we'll keep keep cranking things out and uh thanks again and congrats to uh to eric and and the tool shed and you guys we've had eric on the show a couple of times great dude lots of great content over there too so again yeah, i believe by, they did get knocked no out they, uh, they lost today in the championship all. to fantasy baseball today but again you go up against a big like media conglomerate like that man it's tough it's tough to knock them out it's such a huge yeah. huge following but all right well let's jump into things here um we've got our guest sorry i'm pushing all the buttons and totally forgetting what i'm supposed to be doing here this is awkward for me dap has left the building because his mic and stuff is leaving is, is not working so he i'm sure he'll try to be back but um mike curlin what's going on man um I'm supposed to be switching banners. See, I suck at this. This is why I've got Mike LaPlante usually here. Yes. Uh, but Mike Curlin, MLBPlayingTime.com, over at Twitter, at Mike underscore Curlin. What is going on, man? Glad to have you back. I oh, appreciate it, man. It's fun. Once a year, I know I'm coming on for this, this type of stuff. It's always a good time. <laughs> yeah, we got to get you on more, man. I I, I suck at I'm listening. getting I'm guests. Not, I'm not greedy. I'm good with the once a year. Like This is my thing. I'm all about it. Well, we suck at getting guests on during the season is what happens. So we get all of our guests on during the spring training time and, you know, fantasy baseball draft season. And then we're like, yeah, AJ and I got this. We yeah. don't. We need to have you guys come yeah. on and help us out. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's a good time. So what we wanted to do here today with you, and of course, because, you know, you've been running these crazy good like google spreadsheets for years you, you've now turned it into mlbplayingtime.com which is phenomenal um uh, i've been on it all off season just tracking lineups with you it is it is so great um we want to kind of touch on some of the spring training news kind of some performances what you kind of look at here and just kind of what analysis we should be able to take from this. And let me get all this stuff yeah. off of people's Let's faces since since of... Dap just decided to just rudely interrupt us. <laughs> all right. I was, I was enjoying eating the logo. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But um, all right, first things first, let's uh let's jump into some news here. There's obviously been some injury news that has unfortunately graced our presence uh the last couple days really um start with the two closers jordan romano and Johan duran um it really doesn't sound like either one of them is out long term but what's what's your thoughts on it mike and, and how far down draft boards are you pushing them so at this point in the draft season what we have about a week before games other than the uh the series we just had in korea but uh, games all starting about a week from now so um these guys i just usually let other people take them at this point i don't want to get bogged down trying to play the guessing game duran they called it a moderate oblique strain more so so like a typical oblique strain like four or six weeks is like your common oblique strain for almost every player it's just like the the, the typical range you mm -hmm. get mostly for hitters pitchers are a little different and on top of that now do you have to worry about does he alter his mechanics does he does it he the guy throws 100 miles per hour like on the low end, like he averages like 101, 102 sometimes. So it makes you wonder, like, like will, will he have to pull back on the velocity to get right? Will he hurt himself trying to ramp up? This is Duran I'm talking about specifically. So that's it's just a lot of questions there. And I get tight, I kind of get one of those, like, I kind of step back from these guys when there's, and I could, he, he can, he probably is likely to miss one to two months. It's, it's a, if it's a moderate one, it just happened. I think low end, if it's, I would think at least four to six weeks on the low end. So uh, that's going to go easily into May. But with Romano, the problem is it's a lot of unknowns. I think he's, I think Romano has elbow inflammation, which, yeah, like they don't even know yet. Like, it totally would go, yeah. right? So, so with Romano, it's, is it next week? Is he, does he get back to throwing bullpens like tomorrow? Does he, is he, is he shut down? I haven't seen any updates yet for Romano. I know we'll get some probably as soon as the show's over or tomorrow morning. So um, it's, uh, that's why we're at the point with Romano. It's like, I don't really, so I'm like, you know what? Like I'm in, a, I was in, a, I'm in a draft right now and I have a, my biggest drafts coming up tomorrow and on Monday. And I don't think I'm really going to be in on either of these guys. If I have IL spots, I guess every, it all depends on where you play to. There's different mm -hmm. uh, formats like NFBC that I'm strictly NFBC these days. That's not that's like the um that's 
that's the common industry place to play, but very atypical for like the average player. The average player has right. uh, the average player has maybe deeper benches, or if they don't deeper benches, they have multiple IL spots. So maybe my unfortunately my outlook for fantasy purposes is a little skewed because I think of the you know the leagues I play in, so to speak. But um, at the end of the day, these guys, I just I'll just pivot. I'll either wait and maybe take a shot on, for instance, in Toronto. I think it's going to be Yimmy Garcia probably or Nate, or Nate Pearson. Those are kind of fun names. Mm-hmm. In uh, in Minnesota, everyone knows it's going to be either Griffin Jacks or Brock Stewart. Those are kind of the two names with Jacks being the front runner there. So it's kind of like maybe instead of going for these guys, I'll let someone else stash them, and maybe I'll grab their like the guys next in line and see if I can just get some early season saves out of the deal, and then drop them when these guys return. Um, it's I don't because I don't know. I feel like I, I hate taking on unknown injuries, and especially with pitchers, I, I hate. It's just a personal preference, so. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at with those two specifically in Romano and Duran. I think a lot of smart people agree with you on the the if if a pitcher is injured, just stay away. Um <laughs> it's just but it gets hard my... because now it gets it gets this this we were supposed to be entering this year with like more certainty than ever with closers, and now it's more uncertainty than ever, like in a long time, because we went from having like a surefire like top twenty or twenty-five closers. I think there's like 15 mm-hmm. that you feel comfortable with as like calling them closers right now. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. In a 15 team league or in a 12 team league, that's what three teams getting two surefire closers. And in a 10 team league, you're still only getting half the league with two surefire closers. So you really got to be paying attention to who's getting these. If you're, if you're in a shallower league, pay attention to who's getting those reps first or, to, or maybe hold on to one guy on your bench and call it and just stash them, see what happens type of thing. But, yeah, it's um, it went from being a deeper position, a more secure one to to hey, I don't know what to do <laughs> right now, like almost overnight in with closers. Are you yeah. looking at uh, Eric Swanson at all uh, for that? You know, you said uh, Garcia there in Toronto, but I wasn't sure if Swanson was somebody else that you're maybe looking at as uh, somebody that might pick up saves with Romano out. He would have been if he also didn't have uh, forearm oh, strain yeah. or something. Well, he's throwing great now, according to the skipper this morning. I, 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 I totally get I'm it. Buying it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I mean, but I, I didn't. I mean, basically, Mike, what I'm hearing is nobody should play in saves only leagues. They should only play saves plus holds. That's what I hear. If you're trying to have fun, like if you're playing more for fun, or if you want to change things up, I think it's called sold. I've heard it called sold yep. anyway. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think sold. Yep. I think it's a great format. I think it helps highlight better higher end pitchers like you don't have to just go for saves you can enjoy the fact that you have good players on your team versus having <laughs> having to get these uh sometimes less than quality pitchers but um even if he's throwing and feel, i don't know man that seems like that's a maybe if anything don't touch it it goes it's even more so the reason maybe don't go after yimmy yimmy garcia that isn't costing you anything in drafts anyway people use the word free all the time but yimmy garcia didn't even go drafted in some leagues like in the deepest of leagues i've, I've seen him go undrafted so yeah He's probably like one of the guys like I'm talking like that's like your very back end. Like I'm just going to see if I can get like two three because two or three weeks out of this guy. But uh, yeah, you're right. If, if Swanson's ready, I then he's he would be the next guy up for sure. I just how do you go from having a forearm issue one day like and then one day later the he's saying that you, he's fine. I'm confused. I didn't I honestly missed that report on Swanson today. So oh, it, it's fine. It's just the re- I mean, it's personal, really. I, I, I picked up Swanson uh, on, oh. on the waiver. So I was more checking for me. I don't really care about the viewers at the moment. I was more checking to make sure that I was okay. So that's no, well, if, 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 if there's much. if there's any type of confidence in Swanson's health and he can actually get healthy, then I think he's the next in line. So yeah, I just didn't see the report that he's like already throwing and feeling better. So that's optimism, and that would be reasons why. Because I have I have one Romano share, and in that league, I made sure because it's a draft and hold, I made sure to get Swanson. That's and I'm like, oh, cool. So I have his backup, and then like, no, I don't. They're both injured. Like, oh, great. So, so I'm from having like one <laughs> one closer to I think I already lost a closing that league. Or I have Kenley as it, it was a league. I don't know how mm. I got both those guys. So yeah. Uh, so if I'll t- I have no closers right now as of, as of this moment. So we'll see. But um, yeah, that's the perks of drafting early. It's where you get your best uh, values, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Better, nothing Absolutely. better than losing all of your closers before the season starts. It's okay. Listen, that's why I draft so much. That way, I have some dead teams, and uh, hopefully, the ones that win win big, and I can make a little profit, just a little bit, just enough to keep the addiction going every year. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so we have another injury too that just that just came out yesterday. Matt McLean. Now we've known about the injury, but there was always like this optimism that he was just gonna be fine. Um, 
Turns out not going to be fine. They still don't really know, though, or at least they're not telling us, but they found something on the MRI. I mean, he's uh, to me, it sucks because I have drafted him already. Uh, but I mean, he's undraftable at this point, I would imagine. Right, Mike? Yeah, because he's supposed to be seeing, I think it's um, Dr. Neil El Eltrosh or Elatrosh. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but this guy is becoming known for his like TJ and those types of surgeries, like arm, shoulders. I think he, I think he did, um, I think he did, uh, was it, um, Garrett? Garrett uh, Mitchell's shoulder last year or something like that. I don't know. I, I was looking at some of the stuff he's he's been, but this this whole this whole um, off season, if a pitcher had an elbow injury, I've seen him his name attached to it. So it's one of those things where he's one of those guys now. It's becoming like, hey, if, he, if this guy is seeing this Doctor Neil Alatrosh guy, it's a uh, <laughs> it might be more more concerning than we thought. Let on. So um, that is why because the fact that surgery's on the table just has me like way off. I'm not. It goes back to like the way I feel like at least Duran, you have a the it's it's an oblique, it's not an arm, you know what you're getting into. Romano's still big still more of a question mark. So he's like like he's I'm less optimistic or less interested until I get some more news. And now mm -hmm. McLean kind of enters that because McLean also missed most of spring with an oblique injury himself. And this is the same oblique injury he had that made him miss time last year. So now I'm starting to wonder what his mechanics are that maybe he needs to fix something because he it's one thing after another. If it's not the oblique, now it's the shoulder. And it makes you wonder Agreed. if it's just a swing mechanics issue. Like, is he putting too much torque on his upper body in ways that he maybe shouldn't? Or was the shoulder injury due to compensating because of the oblique? There's a whole bunch of unknowns to that. So it's like, because it's all kinetic chain with these hitters. At the end of the day, though, McLean's a guy that um, between the frequent injuries already occurring this offseason and the unknown potential surgeries, it would have to be a massive discount for me to consider him. And I'm most likely not going to be in that game. If I can give him the reserve rounds, like if I'm getting him as a bench player that I can cut week one, week two after we like, until we get an update, because obviously we, we still don't have full update on things. Sure, I'll take my shot. But um, otherwise, if I'm not getting him the reserve rounds, I'm not touching the plane right now. So just some of his famous, uh, Elatrosh's famous patients include uh, Tom Brady, Otani, Granke, and of course the Major League slugger Arnold Schwarzenegger, Charlie Cerrone, and Ringo Starr. So just wanted to let you know that uh, the, the the new Elatrosh, but here, you know this is where I think a you know website like yours comes in really handy because we were talking for weeks on this show like you know who is going to start for the Reds, and now yes. with McLean is the final domino here. You know, let, I I know we're kind of skipping ahead here to, but I what are we doing with the Reds now? I mean, you know who who were you thinking was going to be out? That definitely has a playing, you know, a position now, or maybe a part-time player that definitely is playing. Well, I think India is the big winner because mm -hmm. India was kind of the guy I'm looking. Agreed. I look at initially like, where can India fit in this lineup? I just don't see it. But now I'm also wondering, does Will Benson? I think Will Benson and Fraley go from being more of like just strong side platoon guys to now they kind of need them against lefties as well. So although they won't play full time, I think Benson might have an inside. Uh, route to playing time i thought it was gonna be fairly initially but then i went back and looked in spring training and benson's getting those reps in center field because they need center field cover because of friedel being out so benson can get some run against lefties and i'm seeing benson lead off i'm wondering does benson actually lead off against righties now so it's like benson's kind of the big name there india obviously uh, i'm trying to i'm trying to because you know obviously doing the projected lineups on the site because obviously because why not why wouldn't i do projected lineups because it's all i freaking stare at for hours on, on end but uh it's one of the things i'm trying to figure out the next leadoff hitter i currently have india uh, projected just because that's where he was last year and i was trying mm -hmm. to just, and, and and he has let off a lot in spring but it's been mostly against lefties it's almost like they purposely wait for lefty lineups to lead off india sure. so i'm i'm starting to lean towards benson actually which might not be uh, um wow. i mean see this is this is when i look at this so i'll go look at roster resources to see what they have because that's like the, uh, them and Rotowire. Ro Ro they got Ro India Ro leading off right now. They have India uh, leading off too. Benson, Benson's down in the six hole. Yeah, and that's I think that's where um, I have Benson also in the six. So that works four. out. Um, yeah. So, but I'm thinking. So I'm almost thinking putting Benson lead off and moving India down. Almost flip flopping them versus righties and then versus lefties, flip flopping them back because the way they've uh, yeah. just by again looking at spring lineups, but uh, we don't have enough of a sample like. I, I have, I, and I had a chance to look at lineups. I actually, because I came straight, pretty much got, got home relaxed today after a long drive, and I haven't, I haven't really looked at the spring lineups yet. So I haven't had a chance to see today's lineup, if they even 
I had one. I'm, I'm going to look it up because um, if Benson continues to lead off against righties, I'm going to make that switch sooner than later because we're getting to that point of the season where, well, like Tay, okay, so Tay against the lefty. I, actually, I remember because Tay against lefty, India's batting uh, lead off again. So India's leading off against lefties, and I have it that way, but I'm not sold on India batting uh, leading off against righties because he, he usually, if I have to look up the splits, I think India was always better. I th- or at least I mentioned, it, I thought he was better against lefties. I could be wrong. Either way, though, um, they like to. This team does move things around a little bit. Last year, he actually hit righties better. That's weird. I remember <laughs> being, well, because I remember India was better against lefties, like entering the year right. last year, which makes sense because if yeah. you look at his splits entering the year, like if you look at, uh, yeah, right now he's been better against righties, but last year he was and a lot better. It's weird. This is this is the research that's being put into the site. So this is, yes, yeah. this yeah. is why this is why you're here, Mike, because you are so. Awesome. If people um, hear me rambling, this that's like you just got an inside look of how my brain works <laughs> on, like, I, on an instant on an instant when I start thinking it, when I have to start if, getting the wheel spinning. If you on a can't look at Mike's site and don't think that this poor guy is probably going crazy, just like okay, India, India, like I I, I just think of all those movies where they're figuring out the serial killer, and I could just see your like entire wall with the little red yarn trying to tie people together, trying to figure out all of the analysis. That's really what I uh I, I can't imagine what you have to go through when some of these guys throw you a curveball. Like, oh yeah, actually, India is going to be cleanup hitter for the year. Yeah, you know, like, like head explodes. Like writing, 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 and guessing the note, like the lineups, and then writing the notes for this would just oh, it would drive me nuts because you're going to be wrong a lot. And there's like all the research you could put into it is like it's. You know, I mean, it's like rankings, right? I mean, it's like we put all this research into it wrong a lot, you know, it's just, but it's like this. It's like you're having to like write little blurbs too. like I, I lose my mind. But uh, I, people say the same thing with ranking. But let's move right. on here. Uh, so I was jump into it's very this similar. Spring. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's very it similar. Is. So like I've done rankings for years. This is the first year I didn't do rankings publicly for anybody. I have my own little like honestly, I actually have I have like all this work. I have no rankings anywhere in any tab. I I I went off the market and I kind of made my own ranks as I go because I draft so much and I'm I play high stakes, so I have ranks in my head. Like I know I could look at the sheet, I could look at places and I I look at the ADP and I kind of move people up and down manually and draft mm-hmm. them as I want. That's how yeah. that, that was my my ranks are in my head this year. It's a weird way, yeah. but I, I I it doesn't matter. It works. Yeah. If you yeah. Know, I, I think it does. We'll see. It's my first year not having written down ranks, but I also I do have a process. It's it's not as simple as I just look at ADP and change it. It's a longer, book. but um, but the lineup stuff, it's just a really good, it's almost like ranks. Like you put like, you, how many times have you looked at a rank? You're looking at number 52, a pitcher 52 and pitcher 54. And you're sitting there wondering, like, I can move this guy up 10 spots, but I can also move him down three. And so it's yes. kind of like, that's how I'm Oh my God. It. I'm doing the, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. Like, and then every little minute injury, like I'm sitting here, like, how far do I drop Duran? Like, yeah what like I, it's a total guessing game i mean at that and, point like and, with these little injuries that we just don't know it's and, a total guessing game and that's why with li- like with lineups the reason why it's like it's 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 a edu- the, with <laughs> sorry it's just so much because um what goes into it is so you saw how my brain kind of worked to try to figure out like right now i'm just looking at one little small spot of the trend right i'm looking at just spring training there's mm-hmm. only so much you can take away from spring training it's very difficult to really get a full read on things but then there seems like the angel with Ron Washington straight up said like, Hey, I don't like how these guys are leading off. I'm leaning towards Aaron Hicks or um, Rendon to lead off. Cool. Now we have an answer. I can readjust because I'm getting something straight, but over Except the year, Rendon's going to play 30 games. So we're good with that. That's fair. <laughs> but if he leads off for 30 games, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, but it's one of those things where, so, but with lineups, when you watch them long enough, and especially with the managers don't change hands so much, you get an idea of what managers' tendencies are. So it's not so much guessing. It's easier to project in terms of like, okay, well, they had these players, and now they have these players with similar skill sets, like the Cubs, for reference. I had the Cubs projected Ian Happ leading off against righties, and then uh, Horner moving down against righties, and then vice, and then they flip on against lefties. Not only did the splits indicate this, but then if you look at um, if you look at Council, he had Yelich and he had uh, Frelick last year. Those were very similar skill sets. You have you had Yelich with the little more power, some OBP skills, and you had Frelick with the hit tool and the batting average. Horner, that's that. That's how, that's his skill set. Hap, that was the other. That was Yelich's skill set. So I'm like, okay, cool. And then on top of that, the best thing about this is I'm really interactive on on X or whatever it's called, which that's what it's called, but it's weird to call it X. <laughs> I'm really active on there, and a lot of the fans interact with me. Like, hey, this is what he he likes OBP guys at the top. I'm like, you're right, he does. 
So I was like, all right, cool. So between some feedback from the fans, because he never said anything, plus based on past record with another team, I switched it like a week and a half before it became a more, because this is right when Hap got injured in spring. So it's one of those things where that's where ha having done this for a few years before actually having these projected lineups and stuff out here, it came in handy because you start learning the nuances of teams and managers and decisions and, you have a team like the Red Sox that if if um, Cora likes a guy, that guy will lead off through thick and thin. Like that's how he was with uh, Enrique Hernandez. It didn't matter how bad he was; he was leading off for like a solid part of that year. So when he said when he said when he said Duran's his leadoff guy, I don't care if Duran hit 100 and like had 0 for two on some bases and did nothing this spring. He's leading off entering the year. So it's like, but you have to know that so you don't change your projection based on spring production because you have to you have to understand the, the manager. So. Right. I do. I do like that. Um, that's kind of like, and I feel like that gives me an edge understanding that. So it helps with um, obviously draft picks and I, I put, putting it into putting the fantasy spin on it. It's hard to do that for other people, but I think it's giving me a a small advantage in a place that's really hard to get advantage these days in fantasy because yeah, has, we all have access to the same information. So I'm taking this information now and I'm putting my projected lineups up there. So if you take mine and you look at roster resource, and if there's a difference. People, I'm not saying you should weigh mine more than theirs, but I have, you know, there's a reason why I'm projecting it a certain way. It's usually an educated. It's not just a guess. It's never a guess. It's yeah. usually based on research. It's based on um, a lot of trends and all the other stuff, not just what we're seeing in spring, but past seasons, managerial stuff, et cetera. Or if we're lucky enough to just get straight up answers like well, Ron Washington's my hero this offseason. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, he's well, all uh, right. Let's let's jump into. Uh, right, yeah, I can talk about some I love of the spring training analysis. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, all right, no, you're so, good, man. You're good. Yeah, let's let's go into some of these spring training performances. I yeah. guess the first off here, um, how do we know of these two options? How do we know Joey Votto is going to be amazing this year? Probably MVP caliber. Is it the fact that he wrote a handwritten apology for what he said about Canada and Canada baseball from 2018, where he said, you know, I think nothing about Canada baseball and I think it sucks, or the fact that he has a thousand batting average, four thousand slugging, um, you know, basically MVP form. So which one of those two basically, Mike, for you, tells you that he's going to be an MVP? this year? I think it's going to be the third option, the fact that the Reds didn't bring him back, and now they actually can really use him. Yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> if you look at the Reds, oh, we, we hey, real quick about the Reds lineup we didn't talk about was the fact that they actually have an opening for like a Nick Marantini or like Mike Ford. Like they are going to be using a guy that shouldn't have made the team in the first place. That's they, had, they went from having so much depth that I had a hard time finding fairly every day at bats and um benson everyday bats initially to uh, and india to like hey now they're gonna be using a non-roster invitee like <laughs> that's where the reds are at so yes Votto, that's how you know Votto's gonna be great because the karma the red that's karma for the reds i think the reds not bringing him back look who's laughing now <laughs> uh yeah i don't know I got nothing. That's all. I, 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 did, I did look at it though. Like I, I, because we, we, we talked about how we were going to ask this question. Um, and then I was like, I pulled the stats because, because that knew this, knew, knew the stats. I was like, and then I looked at it. I was like, it's been one at bat. Yeah. <laughs> he just well, happened one, to hit a home run. I was like, that's awesome. He hit so a home run better. and then he hurt himself in the dugout. Yeah. I mean, what, <laughs> what? Oh that's, my gosh. All right. That's the career I want to have. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> Talked about my no, Tom, you team. can ask. You can ask the next. All right, one. but hey, this. look, the Pirates are doing well, and a lot of good players there. Especially, I mean, a lot of guys I love for best ball, right? Especially um, Sawinski, who I think is just kind of underloved uh, because of what he's doing. But O'Neill Cruz, I mean, what more can you say about him? He just hit two home runs in a game, seven home runs, fourteen RBIs, leading the league in several categories. You have Hayes. And Henry Davis, you know, the catch return, we always knew about his bat, right? But now they finally put him in the outfield. What are you kind of looking at here? Who, who we really kind of focusing other than, are you, do you think O'Neill Cruz is going to give us the full season that we've always been hoping for? He's showing us all this power. Where are we putting Henry Davis? Kind of how are we, how are we supposed to take the spring training uh, fund that the Pirates are giving us? So we saw the Pirates also, I think, for a good portion of the, the beginning of last year, like the first six weeks really right. show out. Like I remember them yep. being good. Yeah, and me too. I think they can be better than we anticipate. I think it's one of those teams that, especially if they've, they're not usually aggressive with their minor leaguers. So they have Jared Jones that might not make the cut. I don't know if he's been sent down yet. And then, of course, they sent down, um, what's his face? Uh, Paul Skeen. So. Those are the types of, but those are the types of guys that they bring them up early. If they're like, if they're doing well in the minors, which I expect them to do, and they 
this is the type of team that if these guys get off to a hot start, why if they can combine their youth with what they have in place because they have a solid mix of like young and old right now, it almost seems like a surprise in that central because it's not the toughest of the divisions right now. It's very winnable, but. Um, in terms of spring stats, what I'm looking for, like, I don't really care about the overall, like the overall production. It's always fun to see like, okay, oh no, Cruz is crushing it. But I, I, what I'm actually the most, the most impressive stat to me isn't the 1,436 OPS. And you think why not? Because I don't care. Cause I expect him to crush what's probably triple a pitching and lesser most of those games outside the first couple innings. But it's the fact that we have a 20% walk uh, strikeout rate, 20.5. So, and a guy who's been striking out the way he has in his career to see Cruz, walking a double digit clip and striking out 20% of the time. That is because you expect that to go up. You expect those things to change a little bit as he sees real pitching more often. Sure. He might go more into the mid twenties, but mid twenties for Cruz is still a win. Cause he's always been closer to 30%. Yeah. So that's the type of thing I'm looking for with Cruz, a guy like um, Hayes, the I'm more curious. I am more interested in the OPS because I'm more curious about the extra base hits and the home run production, because there's, we saw some power gains in the second half when he came back healthy we also saw him run less. So is he kind of going to give? Is he going to run less to try to stay healthy and hit for more power? Um, I think it's in that profile. So it's hard. So, so sometimes the projections won't catch that. So there's give and take there. And then a guy like Henry Davis, I've so I've been watching this one closely, and there's no reason he shouldn't make the team. But there's not only are there rumors, but yeah. they've already lost Grandall, and they're already starting to play these games of getting these other catchers more involved. And they might send Davis down, which would be like, I know I'm getting ahead because I know there's a question about the biggest, like the most shocking demotion. I don't think we've seen it yet. I think Davis could be, and I haven't projected the start, and I'm afraid, I don't want to move off that because I really, because he he's the most deserving and Grand All not being available or healthy makes no sense not to give Davis that role to run with. But it sounds like, like I, I'm seeing rumors of it. I'm seeing speculation. And if that Davis, like, I think Davis could be me. the most shocking demotion this, this spring. Not from a fantasy perspective. I mean, yeah, that would suck. But from a baseball fan perspective, if the Pirates pirate, you know what I mean? Like if they decide to go and be goofy and not let Henry, I mean, if they do it and because they're getting another year of, uh, you know, eligibility, fine. You know, everybody plays that game. But if they do that because they're trying to carry a third, fourth catch. That's nuts. Jason Henry DeLay Davis. and Ali Sanchez combined have a lower OPS than Davis by himself. <laughs> <laughs> just so we're in spring and again right. spring stats don't really matter of but, course but it's, but, it's but still Jason, telling but delay delay and sanchez those guys aren't offensive they're they're not helping this team off offensively now they might be better defensively that part i don't i think it's hard to argue i don't i've heard good things about davis is like he, all offseason he the work ethic is there he put in the work to get better the defense right. has improved but i know i think mitch keller doesn't like to throw to him or something like that which you know some pitchers just have their preferred catchers so I don't know how much of that's going into it. We do see uh, Davis working with Skeens a lot. So obviously that's a thing. Um, I just wonder if Davis is – they not improve as much as the team's trying to let on and be – you know, maybe he wants – maybe they re maybe he really does need work on defense. I can understand that. But I do think um, it might only be maybe a, a couple weeks to a month before they get the extra year. So it could be just a service time game. So that's why it's aggravating. But um, if it, And it could just be as simple as like, hey, because if he's down for even a couple weeks, I'm still holding on. I would stash him all day. Oh, absolutely. But, Especially with, I mean, the kid's special. But there's absolutely. no there's no way. I, I'm sorry. There's no, nobody, no fan, no fan, no anybody. I'm not even a Pirates fan, but no nobody that it watches baseball is going to believe that Henry Davis isn't good enough to be the starting catcher on this team, even if he has a little bit of defensive concerns, considering your other options are career backups right now. 100%. I just, sorry. I had a rant on that for a second. Well, I was, I was, well, I was ready for it too. Cause I saw the pirates. I'm like, I'm going to go off. Cause I'm like, I'm, I might have a huge, like, I have Davis. I have, I have a good, I have some decent Davis shares and I really do like him. And I really do think he could be a difference maker at the position. But right. the problem is, is um not only now. So if Davis is actually going to be sent down, which I don't want to believe it. So I'm still kind of speculating because it's been just speculation, but if it actually happens, which I, I really don't think it will, but if it does, I also won't be surprised just, seeing the fans reactions and there's some guys I really do trust that like really follow the, the pirates and they really think like, wow, this actually might happen. That's why I'm kind of like, Oh, I hope not. Cause it's crazy. But um, now, cause in some leagues, he hasn't had catcher eligibility because he didn't catch last year. So right. now you're waiting for him to come up and gain catcher eligibility. So now it's like what could have been a two to three week wait at right. most might turn into a six, a four to six week wait. If he gets sent down plus comes up and has to gain those five to 10 games, wherever it is in the leagues you play in. So that's something to keep in but, mind. It might be like longer. How much than catcher is he, but 
again, I, I haven't watched every spring training game, but you know, how much catcher is he playing? Because every time I see him, he's playing in the outfield. Is he is he not? Is he still catching quite a bit? He's only last I looked, he was only catching this whole spring. Oh, actually. okay. Well then never mind. Uh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I I noticed that too. Okay. Yeah, he's only so yeah, he, plus plus he was genuinely awful in the outfield last year, like defensively, like negative <laughs> yes. like legitimately negative in the metrics. So Okay, it was one good. of those things where they they he the thing was is after Andy went down they went out and committed to Davis like hey you know you're gonna be the guy entering the year like at least that's what it came off as he right. busted his ass oh sorry he <laughs> he worked his tail off to get a I don't I don't mean one, to that that's over. one I think we're good but yeah. uh he uh swear jar <laughs> he, <laughs> he uh he really worked he really worked at getting that you know becoming a better catcher in the offseason and that mean like that work ethic says a lot he's a former first overall pick too and they're jerking him around like this it's just how do you expect a young guy to get better or build confidence when you're like hey you did great but we're still gonna send you down in favor of these guys who can't hit 200 combined like come on it's awful it's it's an awful thing but um yeah, yeah so so yeah i'm with you like you can see the frustrations there just from a fan perspective because it's like he's good it's why do you not want to have the this guy this guy could be the face of your team this year you know Just yeah, I like pirates. Pirates. I like Sorry, Davis. Peter. I like Davis's upside potential, but I, I think it is weird to have that many catchers on a team. Um, so, moving on to the next guy we got up here is Mr. Zach Galoff, I believe it is Galoff. Galoff. I don't know. One of those. So, Zach has 19 Ks right now this spring, um, but he's still performing well uh, aside from that. So, Mike, are we worried that he's not going to be able to make enough contact this year um, and, and be able to really tap into this immense power that we've seen from him? So, Geloff, the park does him no favors, and he just wasn't – like he, like he, I think nine of his 14 home runs last year were away, and he's still going to play away from – the from Oakland, so the power will still play up. I, I just the, the strikeout rate was always a concern. And he's if you look at his minor league track record, Geloff has always struck out almost a 30% clip 28, 28.9%, 27.4%, 27.9%. These are the last three entering last year's um, major league debut where he struck out 27.3%. However, in spite of those strikeout rates, he's always been like a bit of a power speed producer and always still able to. So those strikeouts weren't like even though they, they've it's been a high rate. He's hit 257 or better at each of his last four stops while striking out, like I said, at the, at the nearly 30%. So I'm starting to believe that maybe he's one of those guys that can contribute in spite of the strikeouts. Um, and he's always run higher bad bips, and that's because the speed's there. Although he hasn't stolen any bases, he's actually over one this spring. I don't think that's going to be a concern. I think we're still going to see Geloff run. Maybe he's just, it's just one of those things resting in spring, but um, the power is going to be hit and miss. I, I, I could, so the projections all have him pretty much a 2020 guy. I can end with a 235 to 245 average. I think that's a very fair projection because the strikeout rate, that's the only thing bad about strikeouts is I do buy the strikeouts being a concern. So he he's one of those guys that can be very streaky. I think I think we caught him on the second half last year, and he I think Gallup just ran with being very hot of a hitter. But it doesn't mean he won't like, it doesn't mean he can't be that guy all the time. It's just one of those things where in points leagues, you don't want to touch him because there's gonna be weeks where he's like a negative producer in points leagues, but then there's weeks yeah. where he can hit like the 40 point mark. It's just what it is. But with Roto, you kind of set him, forget him. And I think at the end of the year, his projection could be a very uh, realistic outcome with room for more. I think, again, these are medium projections. I think he could play more than 136 to 140 games. And um, if he does that, he'll outproduce these projections. But I still think you're getting a 2020 guy with a, at least a 240, 250 batting average. Yeah. I think that's very fair. So the strikeouts, but yes, yeah. I hate strikeouts. However, it's one of those things where if you look at the profile, he's always the Gallup's always been able to perform in spite of him. So I'm giving him a little more leeway than I usually do because if you told me if this was like almost anyone else or like uh, other profiles that like oh look at the strikeout rate, I wouldn't be as optimistic. But I'm still gonna let the I think the tools will still play, and this team's not gonna not let him run with the job. So yeah, there's, there's always those guys that like they don't make a lot of contact, but when they do, it matters. Like it it you know it. It counts. They make it count. Yeah. Uh, really, really funny. By the way, I went on to NFBC and I pulled up his, his like projections page, and they have NFBC must have the columns off by one, because um, I was like, three hundred and ninety eight stolen bases. What? <laughs> they, it's all math. moved over. 
<laughs> I think it's supposed to be 19 stolen bases because then he would have 62 home runs instead of 20. Uh-huh. Yeah, something's a little off here. I mean, 62 um, in the overall round. pick. It's, it's, yeah. And then that's hey, part, hey, and part of the issue. Like one, two times. I oh, so part of the issue with Geloff is going to be the counting stats, right? Even batting second, you can't expect like your yeah. typical your typical two hole hitters. What? 80 80 runs in RBI, like 160 combined, maybe. And that's like lower end usually for a, a two a two spot hitter. And this guy's over here, like we're hoping for 70 70, like uh, 70 65. Yeah, 70, like yeah. every and and that's and it's so Sorry, it's tough. <laughs> so it's like yeah, I haven't found a and, resident and, A's fan, but I am <laughs> like, the, but the like, for, but the strikeout rate and the swing and miss Ooh. in the game is such a it, it is a concern for me to a point where it's like I I, ha, I have no sh- I've, I have faded him all off season I have no shares yeah. and if I miss on him I miss on him if I miss on it I miss on it is what it is but I like certain profiles and his and his profile just screams volatility and I hate that because because of where he's going you can get other guys that just have safer uh, mm-hmm. profiles with similar skill sets and that's even if I don't have the ceiling of a golf I'm okay with taking a little less. And, and having a floor. Yeah, sure. So the, the one thing here, right, uh, as an Oakland A's fan too, right, this is the stereotypical for just people that don't know much about Galoff, uh, stereotypical A's uh, player, right, where he's going to strike out a lot. When he makes contact, it, it he, you know, punishes the ball. But if you're in an OBP league, uh, you know, this is going to be a three, you know, 30 plus OB. He walks a ton and he did it all through the minors. He did it in a short, you know, uh, just the second half of 2023. So if you're an OBP league, you, you definitely bumping them up in the rankings, but 100 percent his, his batting average is definitely a concern. But he yeah. um he seems to do damage when he does touch the ball. Yeah. So speaking of like, so you talked about you know you hate the strikeouts, right? Um, these are some guys who are striking out a lot this this spring. Um, I know take spring training stats with a grain of salt, but look, Kyle Schwarber, Nolan Jones, De La Cruz, all guys who we know have batting average concerns entering the season. And when you see them striking out 19, 18 and 17 times already in the spring, basically leading all of the league. um, Does that make you like want to fade them where they're going in drafts currently? It always turns into a, a more of a player specific thing. Like each player I'll view differently. Some players will struggle more than others. Um, so it really is like, it really depends on the player, but like if it's, it, you, it goes back, like, that's the type of thing I look at when, it, and it really matters based on the player's past or like, so they take, like, like if a player's striking out a ton, like say if it was a uh, JD Martinez, I know he just signed. Right. But, um, JD Martinez struck out a lot last year for the first time in his career. Really. Um, if you continue that this year, okay, maybe he got a little lucky last year where he could be able to, uh, that's a bad example, unfortunately. Uh, I need a guy. So let me give me a guy who doesn't like uh, Luis Arias. If Luis Arias, and, uh, <laughs> I picked another extreme example. I need a guy who's just normal. I need like a like Jonathan India. There you go. India is pretty normal. He strikes out like twenty percent of the time. Whatever. If he strike out thirty percent of the time in spring, I won't overreact to that usually. But um, if it's a guy that, but the thing is, is with him, I feel like there's enough track record to know. Like, okay, India is probably gonna. Okay, he's a little bit struggling in the spring a little bit. He'll bounce back. I'm not really too concerned. He's not. He's, he's not at a weird age where. The, the cliff is there to where I have to be concerned about like this aging cliff or curve or anything. But then if there's a guy, but then meanwhile, um, but like a guy like Geloff, you want to see some growth there and he's not showing it. And it's not just like, it's not just strikeout rate. It, it comes with like a swinging strike rate. Apparently I didn't realize that they give us in, uh, in spring training, 26.5% league average is usually around 11 or 12%. His career average is sitting like he's last year was 16.1%, which is already above like worse than league average. For Geloff, so this is one of those guys where it's like you wanted to see a little step forward being so young and stuff. And what scares you is that he's doing this against spring, spring chaining pitching, which is a lot of minor leaguers, a lot of mm-hmm. fringe roster guys. Yes, Geloff is producing, but why is he striking out 36% of the time at, with most of his uh, bats coming against you know less than MLB quality opponents? So that's where it gets kind of concerning for a guy like Geloff. Whereas if it's a guy, if it's a guy with more proven track record, not really a concerning age. I usually give more a little more leeway. So that's well, what I'm, about a guy like De La Cruz, right? I mean, so you're talking about yeah, like 33% strikeout rate last year. Yes, performed like crazy, counting stats galore. Batting average was an issue last year, especially after the first like 30 games. This spring, yeah, he's batting 282, but he's striking out 37% of the time. I mean, unreal. Like that's 
that terrifies me. And I, I've been a big fade on him at his draft cost. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh, man, I'm so glad I faded. It makes me want to fade him even more. Now, the thing about Ellie is that this is where he's like kind of a unicorn, right? Because I also don't have Ellie, Ellie De La Cruz. And I think it's very popular to fade him. And I have a serious FOMO because Ellie De La Cruz, look what he did while batting 235 last year, right? He still gave you 35 stolen bases and 13 home runs in 98 games. So oh, I know. Ellie, De, Ellie De La Cruz, this is one of those things where it's like you have to, you have to understand that a bad, a bad batting average can come. But he's the type of guy that's going to run higher than average bad bips because the elite speed. And his tools are so elite that Ellie De La Cruz that you just if the playing time is there, he's gonna produce. It just might not be pretty. And yeah. it'll be like we saw how like the fact that he's stealing like he's five for six in spring, he's gonna that tells me like he's running. There's the the green light's there and it's go time day one. Well, how often will he get on base? That's to be determined, but you don't need a guy to be good like at game on base for fantasy purposes, but you do need that for playing time. However, it goes back to what we talked about. The Reds don't have anybody else. So for better or for yeah. worse, Ellie's definitely playing every day. And sometimes you just got to bet on the skills. But like you said, I'm with you. I'm, I don't like the fact that we didn't, we're not getting that improvement in strikeout rate. It's not even close. It's, it's five. It's worse so far early on than what we saw last year. And he's always yeah, been a high I mean, Nolan rate. Jones is, Nolan Jones is the same way. He, he's having a miserable spring. Well, 38%. See, Jones, see, Jones is a little different. There's a little swing and miss to his game, but Jones is so patient. Like Jones is like two. He's one of those guys that's like they always say, "Hey, you got to swing the bat more." Jones is that guy. It's like just swing the bat a little more because I think yeah. Jones sits on certain pitches and waits. Jones Jones is very very particular with his approach. I I, I watch I, I've watched a lot of him and I've okay. looked at his numbers. So Jones so not all strikeout rates are built the same too. But Ellie has a swing and miss problem, but Ellie has tools like anybody else. But yes, Nolan Jones, another guy. Right now, with a thirty-eight, a thirty-eight percent strikeout rate, and was a thirty thirty percent last year, he runs high babbits. Another guy with above average speed, and he picks his spots. So he, but if you if you look at his skill set, yeah, he swings and misses. But like right now, his swing strike rate is still in line with last year. He's uh, Jones is always a guy that has a, a better uh, above average uh, chase rate. He has above average uh, like a below average swing rate. So he doesn't again. He doesn't swing and he doesn't chase. But um, but it, when he does swing, it's usually at balls in the zone. That's why like the lack of contact and all that happens. But he when he makes contact, he also usually barrels the ball very well. And Jones is a guy that I'm I'm a little more lenient with his him and Swinsky is that Swinsky on the Pirates, another guy very similar profiles where the strikeouts are there, but it's not because they can't hit the ball. It's it's because they don't swing enough. It's really weird. Mm. Now if they swung more, would they still have issues making contact? Maybe, but. I don't know. It's one of those things where some guys like Conforto had this problem for years. I don't know if any, and now he's not really as relevant these days, but Conforto was like this where just swing the bat more, just swing the bat more. Cause he just, right, never, right. He just didn't do it. So it's um some of these guys, these strikeout rates are a little more deceiving and, and it kind of shows with a guy like Jones where you see the walk rates are always double digit. So it's like, you know, there's a lot passive approach there to go with a little bit. There is a but the problem is, is there is some swing and miss. I just think he, I think Jones understands the strike zone well enough to where he can just pick his spots and swing it pitches where he wants them when he wants them. I think that's, that's a skill that's hard to really bank on for fantasy, unfortunately. So I understand being apprehensive there at his cost as well. Another guy, I think I have one share of, I got one because I love Nolan Jones. I loved him last year and I just can't quit him. And cores will always help you out produce some of these concerns. Like you can cover up some of these you know, ugly numbers with cores, which is what helped him last year overproduce his numbers a little bit. Right. But, um, at the end of the day, though, it's just like those strikeout rates aren't built the same. But either are these players. Ellie has or has these tools that league winning tools, absolutely. But you're paying. Yeah. For, but the problem is you're paying the premium form right now. Could he be yeah. a top five player? Absolutely, if it all clicks. And I think we, as just the average person, it's hard. It's really hard to uh, project growth in in young players. With Ellie De La Cruz is what 21, 22 years old. So who says he doesn't take us? He's 22 years old. Just turned 22 uh, at the beginning of the year. Who says De La Cruz doesn't take a step forward? Who says De La Cruz isn't two years away from taking a step forward? That's the issue here. We don't know when that step forward's coming, if it's ever coming, but we know the tools are loud and they show the potential. So I think that's what people are betting on is the the growth that can come with the first full year in the MLB after coming off that, mm -hmm. start, that, that season paired with the tools that he has. So I understand completely why people are in on them I, i'm with you i'm just i'm i'm, I'm scared straight scared straight scared because that's a big that's a big uh investment in somebody it's a, who can, it's a big price tag it really is 
but um, there's one person in every draft that thinks he's worth it. So, um, and if they're right, kudos to you because you had bigger uh, than I did. And speaking of cool. high price tags, we're going to get into another grouping of players here with one in particular, Dap. Yeah, um, you know, our favorite topic is how <laughs> high <laughs> has Langford gone? I mean, look, it's been amazing to watch. But you have you know, so many interesting storylines with the Rangers, right? Langford, does he make the team? And of course, where is his ADP today? I mean, it just keeps ratcheting up higher and 91. higher. 91. Uh, Foss, you know, Foss Q, you know, will he fill in for low? Carter, are they actually going to bat him against lefties this year? Or is he just going to be some strict platoon? Um, and of course, all the injuries. Uh, so... You know, I, I said this jokingly in the in the show sheet, but are you willing to bet your uh, your uh, roster is eighty percent correct with the Rangers, with all these kind of unknowns, the last minute type of uh, things here? So Langford's another guy that if you were in if you were in early, you I missed out. I didn't think you, I so I realized this year is the second year where I did this where I just wasn't aggressive enough with projecting rookies for these teams and. So because of that, and I draft early. I draft like as early as November, which is stupid, but I do it because I can't wow. help myself. Yes. Wow. So, so in, in November, he's going pick one, 150 to 200 in that range, usually around okay. 160 to 180, right? Well, right now, and I'm, I'm referencing, so I'm going to reference main events. For those unaware, that's an NFBC uh, format where the buy-in is $1,750, so 1750 So it's like big money, high stakes leagues. It's become like... It's a, it's not a, again. It's a very niche product, but it's where people like. When I, I like the reference where people are putting their money where their mouths at, and I think that's kind of a good way to do it. So right now, Wyatt Langford over the last seven drafts there, which is over the last like roughly the last five to seven days, because drafts are just kind of kicking in for these leagues. He's been going on average pick seven uh, seventy nine or eighty, and his min pick is seventy two. So uh, you're, he's going off as the seventeenth outfielder. So he's going ahead of guys like Trout, Yelich, Reynolds, say say Suzuki. Evan, Evan Carter, his teammate, Tay Oscar. Uh, I, I, I have a hard time with that. I just, the new yeah. price, like the old price, yes, all day. Like, sure. I, but you miss, there's a reason why he went there. You know, the sky's the limit. He's one of those guys that's expected to be like an Uber prospect and all that. But man, it's I, Jordan Walker, Volpe. I mean, Walker, more so than Volpe. <laughs> Walker's kind of the comp in my brain that right. we expected this was happening to him last year. He got jumped up in these same drafts the 100%. same way. This sounds like, like a familiar conversation, Dap. <laughs> we just had this one yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So no, that, yeah, you know, it's here's awesome. The, here's the thing, Curlin, though. What I thought was crazy about it when we went back, we were talking about this exact same thing yesterday, was the fact that people thought Walker was a bust. Now, obviously, where you're drafting was insane, but you know, he had a great season last year. The but second he, half, he didn't hit how... 80 bombs. You know, yeah. He started yeah. off slow and got injured, and then he didn't hit 80 bombs. So everyone's like, he's a bust. And I'm like, that's not you Mike. Know, do you know season. without looking it up? Because I know you're looking up main event ADP. Do you know what White Langford's minimum ADP is on NFBC over the last like week? I I so I actually did catch that on accident. Uh, I was like, it was I was I saw 19. I was like, wait, what? So I looked at dude, this is so bonkers. There's no oh, way. So I saw 19, and that's when I was like, oh, I'm I'm like, let me go check main event just because I went. I wanted to make sure, and because because the problem is is so. When you do, if you do just overall NFPC ADP, and if you want the main events better for 15 teamers, if you want to do 12 teamers, I'd say Rotowire Online is a better gauge because mm -hmm. we, there's a, those are volume and those are 12 teamers. So that'll give you a better right. idea. Of, so right now in those, he's going, his min pick there is 41. That's still a very, yeah, that's still very pretty low. Yeah, over the last, this early. is over the last like week. There's 33 yeah. drafts. Like, this is a high volume. It's a higher stake too. It's like 350 bucks for one of these leagues. So it's not cheap. And um, it's a high volume league. Though. People, mm -hmm. I, I'm, it's crazy. So people are paying. He's still going off as the outfielder 19. And it's it's tough because there's so much proven talent. You're passing on such proven commodities on a guy that, sure, if he hits that even probably his 60 or 70th percentile outcome, probably still going to have somewhat of a profit, at least break even. But you're betting on so much from a guy that has 80 career plate appearances in the minor leagues. And, yes, I understand he was a college bat. I understand that he has this pedigree and – the bat the ball skills are a skill of it are very much strong for for Langford, but I don't know. It goes back to the same reason why I'm scared of Ellie. I'm definitely scared of this Langford price. And if I'm wrong, I, I the thing is, is you have to understand if you have a certain style of, of, of a draft approach, you have to be willing to be wrong. And hopefully you hit on the other guys that you, that you 
believed in or at least broke even at least you know hopefully you if you missed on this you were able to still build a more complete team and not that's not why you lost you know you didn't yeah in ba- one thing about baseball compared to football and other fantasy sports is one like you can the year that judge broke the home run record the al home run record whatever people were like acuna last year same thing where he was like the most profitable player of all time in fantasy people didn't always win their league with these guys these are league winning. These what we would call these guys league winners, right? Because that's right. what they they did things that we've never seen done before, right. or at least in recent history. But in baseball, that guy still doesn't win your league in majority of leagues because you still need a more complete team, and there's, that's why there's it's like, so many more players. Yeah, to where football, I know what you're saying football like one massive breakout can just carry you, I see, especially, yeah, especially you if you stay healthy. Time. With, yeah, with, so. and baseball you, don't get me wrong in, in baseball you still need health you still need that luck that health luck you know every we all need it like in order to really win to win your league from like with 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 relative ease you need to stay healthy and hit on a couple extra players with football mm-hmm. though like you said like all you gotta do is stash a couple like no, i'm not saying it's easy because it's just easier than it's just easier than baseball because like, football itself it's, it's just like you said less less player pool like nowadays with football it's so saturated everyone knows i, I don't even do fantasy analysis for football anymore and I don't follow it like I used to, but I can give me a month and I'm happy. I have, I have the same list that almost everybody else has could be just because everyone's talking about the same players all over Twitter. Cause all I use is Twitter. Yep. Now I, I stopped. I don't even use pods. I don't have to, there's so much good information out there um, <laughs> where it's, uh, that's neither here nor there. We're talking but baseball. Like you mentioned just so much more in depth. And then when a player goes down, it's not just like, Oh yeah, insert here. Here's the new guy. It's well, here's the new guy, but also here's how things change across the board. This new guy won't be as good. And then maybe this guy shifts from like batting ninth to batting sixth. Oh, suddenly he's getting an extra bat a game. And maybe this guy has more. So yeah, maybe this guy actually, so the guy who gains the most value on a, on a team when a guy gets hurt might not even be the replacement of the guy that right. got hurt. You know what I mean? So right, right, right. there's weird, there's weird things with baseball that is very unique to the game. But yeah, back to Langford. Um, yeah, so it goes back to my risk reward. And I, I just in a shallower format, I'll take my shot because there's more potential to replace him. But in these deeper leagues, I I haven't been able to pull the trigger on them. I've been, I've been I've been out on him everywhere. The, I it's funny because I did take him last night in a redraft league, but it's actually a keeper league. Well, that makes so, sense. But I like if you add the keepers plus where I got him, it was like pick ninety ish in a keeper league, and we you know we only keep four players. But I was like, my team blows. I didn't even get to keep anybody this year, so I was like, I'm you rebuilding. I just, I'm taking I'm taking a dirt dart throw i'm just like you know what i'll take my chances and see if it works yeah um so you you had mentioned um you know the replacement players and this and that so kind of flipping the script a little bit you know spring training doesn't really matter as much for the the higher profile players on these teams you know we're we're talking about guys that are going to be your first or second round picks um in your drafts but um i mean the do these guys worry you at all with their if if they have a bad spring training, even though it doesn't really matter to them? Are you worried at that, or are you just saying it's spring training? It doesn't really matter. So it'll it goes. It's very player specific. So um, for Ellie, I would have liked to see the strikeouts improve a little bit. However, they didn't. So is that going to carry over? Is it just because he's getting warmed up? So like that's like with him, maybe I'll add a little more weight like towards that strikeout rate being a concern still. Like it was a concern last year. It's trending towards being one again this year, but it's such a small sample. You need a lot more data for it to stabilize, right? So I'm less inclined to really give stats that much credence unless um what might make make stats matter to me is like, hey, this player is coming off an injury and he just doesn't, he's not doing like he obviously he's not right yet. So maybe I ding him down a little bit in my ranks just because obviously something's not right he's not getting going yet maybe he's behind or like a guy like stanton he hit those three home runs the other day but those three home runs are going to make the whole line look better than it's been all spring but was that the beginning of like okay he found a swing now so from there maybe i make a mark like okay let's watch him from this game on did he get going and was he just warming up because it's such again it goes back to how small of a sample spring is that the stats themselves largely don't matter but what you're looking for is any type of that's why i focus so much on the playing time and stats will matter usually for position battles, but that goes back to your deeper leagues. You're not really focused on the stats for your shallow league guys. You're looking for guys that are going to break, t- break, uh, break camp with the team guys that, or maybe, maybe a guy like Langford where, Oh, look, he's showing out. He could, he can make the team now as a starter. Suddenly he has a huge shift in value, right? So it matters for those guys way more than anybody else. But usually it's such a, it's such a small 
sample. And even then, it's so the guys are like pitchers, especially the pitchers are always working on something. They can go out and get shelved for a six earn run outing because they're just trying to work on their fastball at outing. And people forget that, like, oh, yeah, maybe he was just trying to locate his fastball and wasn't quite getting it where he wanted it. Or if he was throwing like 90% fastballs, like, right. That's all he was throwing. He was working on something or curveballs, like whatever it might be. Like Radon's cutter that every, every pitcher that goes to New York has to do, they have to get a cutter. Everyone cutter. Well, they, they've got, then they just start doing some sweepers too. I know. Didn't Clark? Yeah, they, yeah, cutter? but the main one, like, he was cutter, trying to look yeah. at his cutter there for the first two. It was Everyone getting knows cutter. Yeah. yeah. But that's so, yeah. So when it comes to spring training, um, usually it's like I'll look for pitchers throwing new pitches, but then I want to see how much they're using them if we can get that data, you know. Um, velo is scary because velo is up almost always for guys because in short stints, if you watch it, if you actually go look at a start for, for a starter, you'll notice the velo starts higher in the first inning or two and then slowly trickles down, which makes sense. The guy is fatiguing, but in spring, they're often going two to three innings initially, right? At most, like one, two, two, three, it, it works its way up. So, of course, the velo is going to be up. So you have to be very mindful of that. Now, if it's up like three ticks, then, OK, that's 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 way more notable than one tick because one one mile per hour can just be noise because it's one two innings where a guy has the energy and isn't gassed. But three, maybe that three turns into two or turns into even one, but it's still most likely going to stick because it's such a stark contrast to what we've seen. So stuff like that. Um, I look for outliers like that. To, and even then. I don't put too much weight into it unless it's a guy that like no one's talking about. Like if Mike Soroka, I heard he's up and below changing his pitch mix, but we haven't really seen it. I've just heard it from podcasts and stuff. That's interesting to me because not that Mike Soroka is going to be anything special, but at least there's a reason for optimism. Like, okay, let me add him to my watch list. And if he does anything in his first start, let me add him. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the early round guys though, I mean, long, long story long. Cause that's all I know is long winded answers. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's something. No I way, I sir. No way. Right. I don't put a whole lot of weight out of you. I don't put a whole lot of weight into uh, stats per se, but I like to see healthy guys performing, or if guys come off uh, injury performing a little better, just to see where they're at. Or and like you know the aging guys, like <laughs> like how are they doing this spring? Like are they showing a little bit of youth? Are they sh- like like uh, is Goldschmidt still struggling after last year coming into spring and struggling against lesser opponents now? Should should we should we be more concerned if that's the case? Cause you know, he's like in his mid thirties now and that's old for a, he's 36. Yeah. So he, that's the type of thing I'll look into, but I don't know how much to weigh it. Like, so I don't, I might treat it as a tiebreaker. So if like, I, if I was torn between Goldschmidt and, and Christian Walker, maybe if I wanted to play it safe, I trust Christian Walker cause he's not showing any type of decline in the spring compared to gold uh, Goldschmidt kind of showing a little bit of cur- like some curious stuff with the strikeout rate and all that. But, I'm not too concerned at the end of the day, though. It's just maybe like maybe it might be a tiebreaker. Like, okay, well, I like these guys about the same, but let me go with the guy that might enter the year but a little hotter, right. you know, stuff like that. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. No, fair enough. Right. Um, so let's jump into some of these lineup takeaways. Get back into this conversation here. Um, you know, jump it back into your site, MLBPlayingTime.com. So of course, I'm going to be selfish here and ask about the Orioles. This third outfielder mm-hmm. spot uh, seems to be uh, a little up for grabs. Um, Colton Kalser, Kyle Stowers, and uh, Hassan Kerchad, Kerstead, sorry. Um, kind of the three at battle for it. I know Austin Hayes is there, but he feels like he's sort of just a platoon, like bench guy now at this point. Um, which one of the three do you think is kind of leading the way here? Or maybe I'm totally wrong and it's none of the above. <laughs> well, no. Uh, so I did shift into Colton Kowser's camp. He's been just – he made some uh, adjustments to his swing. And at the end of the day, he Kowser just showed that like, – he's showing why he was a – I don't know if he was a top, top prospect, but I know he's like one of their – like the problem is they have so many top – like they have like half the top prospects in the <laughs> league, it feels like. Yeah. This team – I feel like this AAA team could probably beat – like some of our lower end MLB teams, right? Like the A's and stuff, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, no, I, I only laugh because, because that's an A's fan. Dagger. So, oh, through that was perfect. I knew you were going to say it. If you weren't, I was, so it's okay. Well, that's cool, Mike. No problem. Thanks. I'll, 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 I'll refund. I'll, I'll be the money. taking that I'll, gift I'll, card I'll, back. I'm going to take that gift card <laughs> and I'm going to donate it to the A's fund because they, apparently they can't afford to pay their players, but 
Maybe that'll help. I didn't say they're a good organization. They're awful, dude. Cool. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're their new, new opera house fund. is gonna help raise. Uh, is gonna help raise funds. Uh, you nobody, need. Nobody you need new. Games, you, so like, I thought the Marlins needed new ownership. I, I, they still do. Like even though they got new owners, it still suck. But, uh, but we need, uh, the A's, we need the A's a new owner really and then an exorcism, and then they need to burn down anything that the owner touched or owners touched, and then we can rebuild. It. Well, they already tried doing that by selling off the roster. But Moneyball, any. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, like we have, we have AJ Puck and Lazardo are going to flourish in Miami as starters. Uh, yeah, don't get him we, started. We, we, don't get him started, we, Mike. We gave them to you guys for Groupons. It's okay. No, I'm not upset. I'm not. I'm not upset. Matt it's Chapman, cool. Matt Olson in their primes. Um, yeah, Matt Olson. Yeah. You know, yeah. Matt Olson yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, or you know, or or the big three. You know, Zito, Mor- uh, Mulder for yeah. Mulder oh, was a great trade to the Cardinals. We we really loved all those guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great, Carlin. Thanks so much, man. Hey, you 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 made it to the postseason that one time with John Lester and all that, right? Like that was you guys, right? <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> uh, all right. So that, those, how about them O's? <laughs> so yeah, no O's. Next, next to Orioles. Um. So at the end of the day, uh, so right now because Hayes defensively is okay. Like he's been better in the past, but he's already 28 years old. And the problem is, is Hayes would probably be a very serviceable outfielder or starter on like every other team. And like mm-hmm. any other team would take him and be happy because he's Even above he- average defensively um, for the most part. He could play all the outfield spots. The guy is just solid. Right. And then hitting wise, he's a serviceable hitter. Like he's a league average hitter against righties above average against lefties. The problem is, is league average against righties on a team with like this depth in the minor leagues, like all triple a players ready to be play now. And all of them are lefties. I was like, well, it kind of makes sense to just Kowser with how good he's been or, or Stowers. But I think Kowser might have just the edge on them. It just one of these guys, give them their, give them a chance to be on the strong side. Kowser could play good defense in the corners. You don't need them to play the center. Because you have um you have Mullins there. Hayes could be the fourth outfielder and still, you know, start the occasional righty, not necessarily a strict, strict platoon, but so I'm like, I think so. The way I'm looking at this is because the team's also, you know, I'm trying to read all the beat reports and all that. And the team, it's it's still very apparently it's still very much a decision that needs to be made. But um I do like to think that this team is in that point where they want to compete. And I do think putting the best team forward kind of matters if you're willing to give jackson holiday a shot to break camp i understand he gives you that best chance at that comp pick and all that stuff but if you're willing to do that because it makes your team better and you're willing to give up that year and you think holiday could be good enough to push rookie of the year and when they'll get this stuff why wouldn't you say you know what let's also go ahead and bring up at least another one of their top prospects let him get some regular run and he can he could potentially be a difference maker at least on a strong side of a platoon, he, he could play every day, I'm sure. But why not give him the righties as as left handed bat? See if he can see if Kowser can continue where he's leaving off in spring. And if it doesn't work out, you send him back down. It, it's almost like a win win for them. They, then they have the excuse because not only do they have Hayes, but they also have like 15 other outfielders they can call up. It's one of those things like Mount Castle. How safe is Mount Castle's playing time? The dude hasn't. They, I know he had he had issues last year with the with the uh, with the righty uh, with the with the uh, concussion stuff or was it was vertigo vertigo for him. But uh, he's also in the past, he hasn't been the strongest against righties. So those Mount Castles, and they have other guys like Kobe Mayo and Kerstad that can come up and play first base. Mm-hmm. How long is the, and those, those are, and they're, I think, uh, is Mayo a lefty? I know, I know Kerstad is. Um, either way, uh, yeah, I don't I know if Mayo is. I'm looking it up right now. Mayo's a righty. I thought, okay, I, I thought that's why I questioned it. So either way, so even right. Mayo's a righty, though, he's their top prospect and he's a guy that, or he's one of their top prospects, and he's one. Of, he's a guy that was. If if Holiday didn't break camp, they said that he was going to. They just didn't want to do. Both, they couldn't find both a spot for both of them. So it's one of those things where how long are the leashes for these these veterans that are like lackluster against a certain side or a certain split? It makes me wonder. Like that's why that's why it's like this team can only hold back their guys so long, and that's why I give Kowser the edge at the end of the day. And but but that's me. That's me. And I'm trying to and I'm doing this. I'm reading every beat report I can find. I'm looking up any type of information on Twitter. And it's been pretty much like, hey, it's going to come down to the final day before they make a cut here. But I think it's going to be if it's not Kowser, it's going to be Hayes. I think that's kind of the way they're going to go about it. All right. All right. right. So um, I have to tell you, Mike, uh, there's a lot of things that aren't easy, like obviously tracking rosters but there are things that are easy and that is knowing who the nl rookie of the year is going to be um and i know you're about to say it with me victor scott the third so i just want to make sure that you're on or or the second 
or the second. I, I'm sorry. I, Third doesn't I, exist. I, but as Third, you know, my Twitter yeah. account has become the Victor Scott the second, um, you know, fans page. Uh, I only I only post Victor Scott highlights because that's all he has. Uh, how amazing is he? Does he break camp? Do the Cardinals do the right thing or do they wait, you know, the month and then add him as a superstar? And uh, tell me why I'm not, you know, completely wrong because I'm, I'm right, obviously. And you just are going to agree with me 100%, right? Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> you Scott. owe me after that A's comment, man. So Victor Scott has done everything in his power to break camp. Um, I don't think he's going to break camp and not because he doesn't deserve it, but one, I think they want to see if they can develop some power there. Cause obviously, as you can see, he's has none. All he's doing is profile. If you look at his profile, if I showed you his profile and it's Jerry Ruiz's profile <laughs> next to each other, he's the NL version of that. He steals a bunch of bases but at least at least Scott can play defense. Like his defense is expected to be. I was about a to say he, he plays the defense that I believe he walks just a tad. But yeah, well, sure. he at least in spring he's walking a ton. But yeah, I, I, maybe he didn't have to walk a whole lot in double A, triple A, and single A. So I thought I was actually thinking he would break camp, right? So I reached out to one guy that I know knows the Cardinals not only better than I will ever know them, but also he actually has sources within the team. So I have a source that has sources, right? So I have, uh, I'm, this is like, I have sources right now. Um, I, I don't think he would care if I mention his name, but I don't want to put him, throw him under the bus. So I'm not going to mention his name. So it's a source, sure. right? Uh, Tell so us about the sorcery. Yeah. Sorcery. Yeah. It's magic, man. I got a, uh, so I talked to him. No, about sorry, you're, you're, you were talking to Tony LaRusso. Go ahead. At a bar. Um, yeah. <laughs> naturally. Um, I was, uh, uh, so I was talking to him, just asking about because I always check in with him on Cardinal stuff because he he's really helpful with this stuff. And he's like, yeah, man. So because like, he's like, he told me there was like no chance like a week ago, right? So all right, cool. Because I was gonna plug, I was actually gonna put Scott in as a starter, plug him in, project him, and then I yeah. talked to him. He's like, all right, no, no, no chance. And then a week later, I'm like, dude, what's going on here? Like, because like the reports are that he might still make it. So right. he reached out to somebody and he's like, the, the, he's like, yeah, kind of like 60, 40 still no, and then. He still thinks it's not going to happen, not because he's not because Scott doesn't deserve it, because they right. want to see what they have in Carlson. They want to get the most out of him, see if they can see right. if he can actually do anything. And I think they want to see if they. I don't think Scott has power in the profile, but maybe they, I, something about they want might possibly see if they can get some power out of him. Or I don't know. They have nothing else to. What no other reason to put him down there? It's not defense. It's not speed. It's not like I don't know what else they're going to do besides um work on his uh power production which if you look at his grades on fan graphs which is all i have access to right now it's raw power is 30 game power is 30 that's pretty much as low as you can go i don't see room for growth there if they don't if they can't project it if they're not projecting it because they've hit the nail on the head for 80 speed 70 fielding like that's and a 45 50 on the hit tool so that's gonna be above about average so um at the end of the day though scott is deserving for defensive purposes alone and he's a better hitter than carlson at this point I'm surprised they're not going to go with Scott, but I do. Th I'm going to trust him, and he's pretty, pretty sure that he's not going to break camp, even though he thinks Siani is like one of the worst players in the league. So, I think it's a short. I don't think it'd be a long stint in the minors. It might be the Super Two date. It might be uh, Carlson gets a month or so just to show them that he's just to show them that he's a failure before before Scott comes up. That's something I think. That's the only thing I think of because um, I really did think Scott was. I thought Scott was going to, but after talking to him. Right. I, I he he swayed me like look like people even people in the org might want it but they don't even see it necessarily happening so well I have to then let, let's get away from my love for one second um, although right now you are the absolute worst guest we've ever had uh, that's just, fine I think I think Joe you agree right I, 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 I like to right. set the bar yeah <laughs> no I mean absolutely anybody who's come on just crush every hope and dream i've ever had the, you know the um, 465 people watching now probably our record high yeah. um uh, but, holy no uh, mike so oh. <laughs> with this insider tony la Russa, that you um have been talking to constantly um is there anything non-victor scott related that you know is kind of interesting that maybe you've touched on on your site that no you know these are people that have never seen you before that maybe you want to uh touch on by this you know anonymous tony la Russa? All right. First of all, before you answer, Mike, I need to butt in. His name is Loni Tarusa. Okay. Okay. That's Loney the Tarusa. source's right, name. Got it. Let's Loni see. Tarusa. So I don't. What was the question again? <laughs> I don't know. I was, just, I, was just, I was just wanting to see if you know you've what used this source you? this past week, <laughs> and any other you know capacity with the Cardinals. 
that you know maybe had some more oh. interesting news than Victor Scott. No, that was pretty much the, like the one thing that because like I think everyone knows the rest. The thing with the Cardinals, is everyone knows kind of the rest of the lineup, right? It's sure. um, Edmund had the setback. Lars Newbar, we're waiting to see what's going on with the fractured ribs. Um, right. So it's more of a we're gonna see Dylan Carlson get regular run. Some you'll gain some playing time from the lefties, like the Brandon Donovans of the world, and Nolan Gormans. Suddenly, those guys have a spot against lefties, whereas before they wouldn't have, because this okay. team is carrying three lefty bench bats, which wow. again makes no sense, but right. that's what they decided they wanted to do. So that's going to leave lefties playing against lefties, which I'm good with because again, they give Norman like, Gorman's shown flashes you can hit lefties, and Donovan can just hit the ball, period. Not very hard all the time, but at least he hits the ball. Sure. Um, so that's kind of like the other good things, I guess, if you want to see some stuff that will fall out from this is Donovan and Gorman probably end up being more regular than non because the other guys on the bench are going to be like Burleson, who's going to probably play against righties, against lefties, Crawford, who's just the backup shortstop in case Wynn can't do much. And then Carpenter is just Matt Carpenter at this point. Like he'll play against some righties on days off and stuff at first base in DH, and that's about it. So uh, this team's very cut and dry in terms of who's going to be the starters like 90% of the time because they hate Victor Scott. All right, sorry, and I'm, and apparently they hate Depp. So, yeah, that's, all right, that's my thing. So, what what does the banner say, Victor Cruz? Is Did it real? Is this about the giant hashtag suck at Keith? Is this our op- opportunity? I have no idea. This is me trying to make Keith? it while I was. I, I I didn't do it, so whatever it is, it's not my fault. This was totally my fault. Okay, Mike Laplay, you're not allowed to not be here anymore. Sure. Yeah, how dare you drive to Vegas? clown who does that all right let's uh let's move it on here to the next beautiful question that we have for you mr curland you have bryce terang and joey ortiz in the lineup um, now we've seen a lot of either terang or ortiz but not really both so why do you think both of these guys are going to make it this year so the big thing was I, I was waiting for it pretty much most of like spring where they would give us terrain. They wouldn't give us Ortiz at third base at all. And they finally started giving us Ortiz at third base. But the problem is, is then so I'm like, okay, cool. Um, they'll give us Ortiz at third base and that leaves second base wide open for Terang. And the last time we saw it together was the 16th. So four lineups ago. So yes, I understand the apprehension. The problem is, um, Ortiz, I think Ortiz is a natural fit. So, like, if you look at yesterday's or the 19th on the lineup, I, I again, I haven't checked his lineups yet, so maybe it happened today too. But on the 19th, Ortiz played second base against a lefty. Ortiz's defense is elite. It's stupid good. Like, it's one of those things where real life baseball, he should be starting every day. The problem is, is they came out yesterday, I think it was, and mentioned Sal Frillick is going to get a lot of that run against uh, at third base, right? So, when you look at the lineup on the 18th, you realize, okay, that has a very realistic feel to it because minus Joey Weimer, that's the thing. So if Weimer uh, and Weimer's going to factor in as well, because he's not going to just sit and rot away on the bench. Right. So this team just, I think what it is, it's going to be kind of a revolving door against righties. I think Trang being the, uh, the lefty and really good defensively as well. He'll play second base against righties. I just have a hard time believing Ortiz is in a strict platoon because of the fact that they used, um, they used, uh, what's his face? Corbin Burns to acquire Ortiz and Hall, right? right so yeah. why would you acquire a guy just to be a weak side platoon bat? I don't. I now do I think he's gonna be a full time player to start off? No, it's not gonna be that simple. But this team's gonna move parts around. Frelick's gonna play the outfield at times. Ortiz will play third base when he plays the outfield, and like Yelich is gonna get days off. Contreras, get Mitchell. These guys are all gonna rotate in and out. So it's one of those things where. Ortiz might be more of like a four game a week guy instead of a five or six, unfortunately. So for fantasy purposes, I think Ortiz takes the biggest hit from all this. But how long is Terang's leash? Does Terang have a, if Terang hits like he hit last year, was are they really gonna stick with him just because he's a lefty over Ortiz, who had a really strong triple A season? Actually, most people might not realize and really interesting some underlying um, numbers, but also the defense is so elite. And I think the idea was to like get Ortiz for the, I think he's the future shortstop there. They wanted, I think they were trying to trade Adamas and maybe they just then made it. So I could see come half, come the halfway point, Adamas gets dealt, especially if this team is uh, struggling. So then Ortiz might be more of a second half type of guy to look out for. But, uh, but yeah, on the, on the, on MLB playing time.com, I have Ortiz as a part-time player against righties. 
So he's in the lineup technically, and that's what. But I do try to color code. Let me make sure the color coding is correct. Yeah, I do. I, see that. I do try to keep them color coded appropriately. That way, it shows like, and obviously, I show. I tell you what each color means because um, I have him as a part time player against righties. So I do think it's one of those things where it's just maybe I need to update the notes to, to suggest this, but it's gonna be more of a revolving door. So like right now, I have Ortiz plugged in at third base and Frelick in right field. But they mentioned Frelick's gonna hit play third base a lot against righties. So even if I change that around, all it's going to do is move Ortiz to the bench as a part-time player and put in another player as a part-time player because I, I think we're going to see the lineup I have. We're going to see that from time to time. We're also going to see Frelick at third base, Weimer or Weimer in at right field like they showed us in that one lineup I was talking about. So I think this team's going to have a bit of a revolving door until things stick or until there's – and then once the injury happens, before you know it, remember like we, we said this about the Reds just a week ago. <laughs> one injury and now Ortiz is an everyday guy. One injury and – Weimer's an everyday guy. This team doesn't have the right. same depth as a Reds. This team has just enough to get by. So one injury, suddenly they don't have that that type of depth where everybody can kind of get in there and get involved. So yeah, I, I but at the end of the day, um, yeah, it's pretty much what it is. Is Ortiz is probably I I, I probably need to update the notes for context because I think Ortiz is just he's taking a playtime hit right now, and I don't think he's an everyday guy entering the season. So I do think you'll see lineups like the one I have projected, but. That's probably not going to be the everyday lineup. I don't really think we're going to see an everyday, and I did air quotes for those listening, an everyday lineup for the uh, Brewers against righties. Yeah, I mean, even today, I looked at it just real quick because you mentioned it uh, today. Freelick was a third. Uh, Weimer was in left field. Terang's is second. So it's yeah, it seems like it's just bouncing around. Well, and so. but this is but now this is the second time they showed this lineup. So I'm actually and but now Bowers is in, which we know that's not going to happen often. But Bowers will get in there at first base when Reese Hoskins DH is like you. So, um, but right. because they, because they have all these parts, they have all these parts and pieces. There. It's a, it's a bit of a mess. So I honestly think I might have to switch that just because we're seeing more of this type of lineup where Ortiz is trending more towards a weak side platoon. Again, I don't think he's going to be in a strict one. But it's just one of those things where it shows you that Bowers is going to get his. Weimer might be more playing time than I anticipated, honestly, because I wasn't sure about his role. I had him more of a weak side guy and a part timer against righties initially, but then I took off the part timer things. So I was like, I wasn't sure what they were going to do, but it looks like he's going to get in versus righties because they don't want him to rot on the bench. So I think it's just going to be one of those things. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe them getting smoked seven to one against the Giants right now will make them change their minds. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I don't know. The funny anyway, part is, if you look at it, it's like their it's like their A lineup against their like C lineup. <laughs> like their best player today is maybe Blake Sable. Like it's bad. Like Luis Matos is uh, Luis Matos is in there and Marcos Luciano, but those guys haven't been great. I don't know about Matos, but I know Luciano hasn't been. Good Jake Bailey. <laughs> yeah, I mean Matos was supposed to be something uh, there. It was Luciano. Luciano. Uh, yeah, I mean they found Duvall yeah, and I'm giving up on him, but. They I'm, I'm Taylor really Rogers excited about what you said about Ortiz him. because I know we were throwing tomatoes at that trade uh, for a while for what they did with Burns, but so I'm I'm just hoping they get some type of extra value there. I, you know, uh, with DL Hall, you know, they, they, you know, Milwaukee does develop great pitchers, but uh, I was, I'm hoping Ortiz turns into something. I'm not a Milwaukee fan; it's strictly from a baseball perspective, especially in Dynasty. <laughs> All right. So let's close it out here. We haven't talked much about pitching at all. So let's get at least one pitching question in here. Who's a fifth starter who's going to get the job that we should really be looking out for in, in fantasies, maybe like a quick waiver wire ad at the beginning of the season, or even like a late, like late round pick dart throw. Um, so there's a few, well, see, uh, I guess Ryan Weathers, he's having like, Miami just produces pitching, right? So Ryan Weathers Velo's up, I believe this spring, I was going to say puck, but he's been named like the number two or three starter already. He's and Trevor Rogers, pretty much any of those back end Miami guys. I really like, uh, I really like stone from, um, I always won't call him Garrett stone. And that's, that's not the right yeah, stone. Uh, yeah, so stone, stone right? Garrett. I always think of stone yeah. Garrett and I'm like, that's not the right stone. It's, um, First name here, Gavin Stone. That's why. Gavin so Stone, Stone yep. Garrett, Gavin yep. Stone. So Gavin Stone for the Dodgers is one of my favorites. But Team Beat, go. What? I'm oh, sorry. You just it sounds like you're pulling out all the teen idol names. Yeah, yeah. Garrett Stone. So I got. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> caught me off guard. Um, so you have uh, that guy. And then you have um, what's another one I like? Oh, uh, Dio Hall. But he's already. I think he's more than a, a number five. But he's kind of just a guy that. He should make the rotation. Maybe people aren't quite sure, weren't quite expecting it. So um, those are just a few names like um, that come to mind that 
definitely have earned spots. Uh, Garrett Crochet is the opening day starter, but he was a guy that still, I mean, I'm not sure there's really much to expect, but he's a guy you should definitely be. He's a former top prospect. Yep. Definitely has some stuff. More of a two-pitch guy, so uh, keep your eye on Garrett Crochet. I think he's upside there. Maybe add him and watch where it goes or just keep him on your watch list. But uh, he's going to start opening day. I don't know how stretched out he is. He, he could only pitch three or four innings. might be a, more of a piggyback situation. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they're still trying to work him, stretch him out. And then he has stuff to be good if he if it clicks. So he's the guy that, although he's technically not a fifth starter, he's still someone that most people aren't drafting early. So... Yeah, what about are, like the the Varlins and Reese Olsen, those those like those so two Re- guys? Have been- Reese Olsen is tough because I don't protect him to make the rotation because I think Mize takes my I think I have uh, let me pull it up real quick to make sure we get it right because there's a Reese Olsen. So I was reading about it too. Olsen can open up as like a multi inning guy to start out because they're gonna pull they're gonna bring him into the season, but they have Scooball, Flaherty, Flaherty, and Maeda that are guaranteed. And then Matt mm-hmm. Manning and Casey Mize are believed to be the favorites to uh, round out that rotation with Olsen kind of being the outside looking in guy. So I have him as the next in line on the site. Okay. And uh, but he's supposed to start off It's one of those things where he could piggyback and they actually use the word piggyback because I put it in quotes in my notes. So um, he can actually piggyback. So it wouldn't like, you know, if they were trying to ease Mize in or Manning or if one of those guys get like, a, you know, they they run their pitch, their pitches up in the first week. Reese Olsen can easily come in and be that guy. But um, at the end of the day, I like the fact that Olsen's already in a role like that just tells you that all it takes is one underperformer or one injury and he's already he's right there. So mm-hmm. I do like Olsen, but I do tend to favor Mize and Manning because I think those guys get the first shots at it. And for, who was the other name you mentioned? Varland. Uh, Var- oh, Varland. Varland. Yeah. I used to, uh, last year I called him Varlander because it was close to Verlander <laughs> and I just I was so in on him. <laughs> nice. I was I was so. I mean, if it sounds the same, he's gotta be good. I'm feeling that one. Yeah, I'm (laughs) sorry. I'm uh, borrowing it. Yeah, so uh, it's one of those things. Yeah, Varlander. I called him Varlander last year, but then he would fail me and get blown up. So I was like, but I'm still in. I still have a decent amount of shares. I'm. I'm not. His price has gone up, obviously, because he's been confirmed for the rotation at this point. So that kind of uh, makes things a little weirder. But um, oh, I don't know if I realized that. Yeah, he has uh, oh, this Stefani. This Stefani's out with. Uh, oh, that's injury. right. No, th- I did know that. Damn it. And because Sorry. because this goes out, it's a. Uh, right. It's just yeah. So it's it's kind of a mess. <laughs> so it's like, but yeah, but Var- Varlander is definitely going to be in. He's interesting. He has upside. I've, I've I watched a lot of his starts last year, and then of course he goes out in spring, and gives up like eight earned runs in nine, and like like I don't know, it was crazy. Nine hits, eight earned runs, something stupid just the other day, but I you know. Again, goes back to what was he working on something? We don't, we don't right. know. Right. Um, but it's so hard to say. The, the problem is, is he has stuff, and the stuff really stands out for Var, for Varland. The problem is, is the, I want he leaves so much over the plate. So it's like I, I he just lacked the ability. Like I just would watch him. He just wouldn't put pit players away. The hitters would just stay in counts, stay in counts, and then one he would just leave one pitch over the plate a little too much, and it just got he almost you know like it's weird because you always want pitchers to attack the zone, but he almost attacked the zone too much. So that was the so it's it's frustrating. So I'm gonna have to go. I want to watch him first few outings. I'm definitely gonna roster him. I definitely think he should be rostered in most leagues, if nothing else, on your bench. See where it goes. But I I do have my uh, reservations reservations something like that. I don't yes. know. I, I do have my concerns. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But I really like him. All right. All right. Um, I think that's it for the. Uh... For the show here, does uh, Mike, anybody uh, have a ton of notes that they just got from the last two hours? I mean, I, I literally, <laughs> I think I wrote a, like eight pages of notes. So I've learned way too much. But at the same time, now I have buyer's remorse on the, all the drafts I've already done. Thanks a lot, Mike. But you know, this is this is awesome. Thank you so much. Of course, this yeah. is uh, I, I. This is literally what I do now, right? This is, <laughs> I've kind of just like committed to like this is my thing, and I, I love it. It's a lot of fun. More to come, of course. Yeah, no, we uh, we definitely appreciated it, uh, Mike. Before we let you go, uh, remind everybody where they can find you and what you got going on this season, man. So yeah, it's uh, you can just find me on X at Mike underscore Curland and MLB, MLB playing time dot com. Just if you come to the Twitter, I post everything. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much my all in move. I've I, you know I've written for the Athletic. I've I still write on occasion for Fantasy Pros as a freelance writer, but not so much these days so it's pretty much like 
not just the lineups are on there too. I, I, I do every team page has notes like so I add mm-hmm. context so you, and you get like if there's injury note injury news or anything else, I update them just to help give some more information and context to things. Also, I do uh, little mini articles like quick write ups of like, hey, look, this is what happened today, and here's the playing time fallout. And I like to just kind of throw those out there so people understand, like, okay, so this injury happened. This is what to watch for now. Like, this could be the next guy up, or this is how playing time might fall, or whatever it might be. So I like to try to give con- – I, I try to just kind of bring all that together in just one site. So it's just all about playing time, all about all that stuff. So it's kind of – it's a niche. It's a niche product, but I do like – I like the way it's going. I really enjoy it. It's a fun thing to do. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, we, uh, we, we love it, so – Tons of great information. Everybody go check out the site, MLBplayingTime.com, and check Mike out on uh, Twitter slash X. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. See you, Mike. All right, fellas. So next week, our show, I'm not totally confident AJ is making it, uh, is, uh, is, is opening day. And AJ's going to opening day, so right. good luck sure. with uh, him making it. But uh, yeah, we have we have officially arrived. No more draft shows. Uh, but uh, oh, actually, some some news. If uh, if you're catching this on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen instead of watching it, um, we did launch our audio network i don't know exactly what i'm calling it i did call it the fantasy six pack audio network is what i called it for now might change it but it is over on uh it it will be over on all the platforms that you can listen uh some it'll be all of our non-podcast affiliated stuff though like dap and i did all of our like sleepers and busts and we just did the adp movers thing we're gonna have the football stuff over there uh, as well. That is, you know, like waiver wires, all that kind of stuff. All the random, like, not a f- podcast affiliated stuff will will be there. Uh, it was about time. We need to find somewhere to put the audio versions of those that the great content that gets put out here on our YouTube channel. So, uh, go ahead and search for that. And uh, yeah, yeah. So one last thing name. is with the with the season starting. Uh, you know, you'll be catching a lot of me. Uh, throughout the week with various shows for baseball we will have the waiver wire show that we'll be doing mm-hmm. weekly along with the article that'll be going up as well we hit a lot of great waiver wire selections last season you can definitely check that out if you yeah, just want to look definitely. for 2023 uh but there's gonna be a ton of content going up as well on our youtube channel and on spotify as well so. fantastic all right guys well we did it we are here we've gotten through all the draft shows thank you aj and dap for helping out and uh helping me get there so we yeah, will uh keep you online i know i know i know all right well that is it see you all next week for opening day